I am super excited to share with you all about becoming an expert developer, just in case. So I guess you should be able to read that behind me. Becoming an expert debugger. If I'm guessing my audience right, uh, most of you probably work on e-commerce sites of one size or another, one shape or another, in one vertical or another. And it's probably, if I was to make a, I think a pretty accurate guess, it's probably pretty often that we run into these problems, and if we're being honest with ourselves on Magento, that, you know what? It's kind of one of those head scratchers. In fact, this afternoon, we had a delivery scheduled for 5 o'clock p.m. Now, that's a bad time for a delivery, but it's kind of how we've worked things out with this merchant. 5 o'clock p.m. rolls around, and, well, about 3 o'clock, we were doing our final test, teeing up for this delivery, and the build is broken. And we're troubleshooting and we're trying to figure this out and the styles are broken on this. And of course we can't ship a build to production that has broken styles. And we're, we're digging into this and just nothing really seems to be digging anything up. In fact, the error that we found as far as when the styles are being built, we traced that back. We found the exact line that was in the code, nothing. And at the end of the day, which is no pun. Well, actually, I, I should say there is pun intended. How do we get this problem fixed? Using the techniques we're going to talk about in this presentation, we were, I was able to figure out that this problem was actually had nothing to do with styles. That was just a red herring. It was something that looked like it was had to do with the styles. But no, it didn't have anything to do with broken styles in the site. In fact, it had to do with this class that I had added one little item to the constructor, which had this cascading effect going down the line of, of and finally called a constructor that did a whole bunch of damage in the system just by adding one element, one uh, item to it, one of my constructors. This is becoming an expert debugger, and this is how to solve those crazy difficult problems that keep you at work late but you would be at work way, 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 way later with unhappy customers if you didn't know these techniques. So let's dive in. So who am I? My name is Joe Maxwell, Joseph, whatever you want to call me. Husband, father to three very uh, fun children. They are, they, they, they just can't, uh, they, there's no way to be around them and not smile. I love the Magento platform. We build on it all day, every day. We solve problems on it. We build features on it. That's what I do every single day and a lot of every single day. Just recently released uh, here in last year, my first book ever, The Art of E-Commerce Debugging. We're going to be approaching some of these concepts that we dig into in this book, and we're going to be talking about those here in this talk now. But one thing I wanted, I want to quickly call out, though, that I think was really important to my journey, and that is that I started solo. I, there, I had literally nobody to go to if I ran into one of these difficult problems. I didn't have a senior developer. I didn't have an architect on the team. There's nobody. And it kind of felt like the bugs were more slaying me than I was slaying the bugs. So... Yeah, it, it was it was problematic. Let's just put it that way. And I had to learn these these techniques, these 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 solutions in a kind of a trial by fire environment. And now, of course, I am blessed to be able to work with a really wonderful team. And I, I feel like I'm honestly one of the dumbest people on the team now. It's just <laughs> it's just how it works. There's some really bright bulbs I'm able to work with now, and I'm constantly challenged every day. But here is one of the most frustrating parts of working with a platform. You might say like this. And that is that we might, we start playing this game of whack-a-mole. We try the same thing, okay, in different formats. We, we try to fix a problem over here. Well, then this problem over here pops up. And then this problem over here pops up. And it's ridiculously frustrating. Okay, well, so let's say, let's, let's dump, jump it up a, a notch here. The website is down and we don't know why. But I'll tell you what, the merchant sure as heck knows that you're not a good developer. In fact, you suck because you can't fix this problem quickly. 
We've all been there. We've all been in these type of situations and we're trying to communicate like, look, this is a real serious problem. We're doing everything we can to get this solved as quickly as possible. But this is a challenge. And I'm going to be giving you suggestions on how to fight through those. But one thing I don't want to de-emphasize, in fact, I want to seriously emphasize, you are a hero. In fact, you as an e-commerce developer working on the Magento platform, you are an absolute hero as you solve problem after problem day in and day out. And unfortunately, you are underappreciated. Most often, you are underappreciated. And I want to extend my gratitude to you for keeping the lights on throughout the world. You are, bringing, you are putting food on the table for these merchants because of your skill set. And I want to give you a gift here today of increasing that skill set. Problem with some of the stress is that we enter this fight or flight mode. And I'm starting my, my teaching here, if you will. We start this fight or flight mode. We are zoomed in on this style issue. The build is broken. The styles are down. What can we do to fix this? Well, we got to fix it now. Well, and ultimately, the problem keeps reappearing, right? It's appearing in one way or one area or another. It keeps popping up. And of course, Merchant thinks we don't know what we're doing. But again, you are the hero. And so this evening, or actually <laughs> for you this morning, I want to introduce to you a good friend. His name is Tad. Very friendly, likable uh, fellow. But actually, not a fellow. That would not be correct to say that. He is a idea. He is a concept. Tad. Let's meet Tad. And then we're also, actually, I forgot to say, we're going to talk about the toolbox. So two things we're going to jump into here in our time allotment this morning. So Tad. So again, he's not a person. He's Tad, but not TAD, really. Um, what is TAD? TAD is an acronym. Before we dive into actually what this acronym is, how it, what it does, I would like to talk about how it will help you. As you implement this system for debugging into your life, it will help reduce your tunnel vision. Remember, as we focus in on this issue, I talked about this deploy issue. We just literally fought through this evening. It's easy to get tunnel vision. Okay, the styles are broken. The styles are broken. Okay, how do I go fix the styles? What style sheet is, is this broken in? Oh, I get an error right here. Oh, this was in, was it email fonts.css is not found. Okay, why is email CSS not found? Well, maybe I can bypass this error. And literally that was what one of my solutions was tonight to try to bypass that error. It was a bad solution. Instead, it forces us to back out and say, okay, the email fonts, Okay, that, that wasn't the solution to the problem. Okay, now what else could it be as opposed to just email fonts, email fonts, e as opposed to just constantly looking at this one thing and figuring out every solution possible for it, but ignoring the whole big picture. It forces us to zoom out. So here is what this acronym stands for. Three very simple uh, phrases. Number one, take an inventory. Take an inventory. Number two, attempt to fix. Number three, do it again. Number one, take an inventory, take, attempt to fix, and then we do it again. What we see here is a cycle. And there's nothing crazy intuitive about this and certainly nothing new about this. But it's a cycle. We're going to start, we're going to approach a problem. We're going to see, hey, what's going on? What's the big picture? What can we do to solve this problem? Number two is attempt to fix. Okay, we're going to implement our solution. Does this work? Does this not? But then number three is just as important. In fact, it might be the most important step of it all. We're going to stop. We're going to back up. Or we're going to start over again. And I'll be really honest with you. Tonight, I did not do a good job. It was after what, six o'clock. Uh, my mind was not working terribly well. And this is when I needed it most, and I didn't do it. So uh, this, there takes a level of discipline and it's especially hard when you are tired. You just want to get this done. This would have helped me significantly if, if I would have done that, do it again, take a break, come back to it. So let's dive into each one of these steps and see how it will help you. But before we do, we need to understand the keys. And here are the keys. Number one, we have got to enforce time limits. If you're just sitting there working at your desk, you don't enforce time limits, like I, like I said I didn't do tonight, this system doesn't do you any good. 
the whole goal is is to use these to compartmentalize these different sections of approaching a problem and up to apply the time limits to these specific sections and then use these time limits to reevaluate when you need help it's incredibly frustrating i know have for a senior developer to be approached with a problem with no troubleshooting done whatsoever or the troubleshooting being done not documented written up and presented to the senior developer go through a one round of take uh, of of this tad framework do it again we'll talk about what the step is specifically but write down your finding and then present it to a senior developer you and them will work very well together to come to the solution to this problem i also find that work you must work at least two rounds to come up with a permanent solution why do i say that well, it's easy to look at a problem and say, oh, there's a problem here. Here's the solution. It's found in the database. This row value needs to be changed to X, Y, Z value, and we're good to go. Great. You want to know what? Two weeks later or less, <laughs> the merchant calls you up and says, ah, the problem's not fixed. You fix it that one time. It's not fixed. And you're like, oh, crap. Uh, yeah, well, I... I, I fixed the problem. They say, well, it occurred again on this order. And you're like, oh, well, let me go change the database on that order. And they're going to be thinking, well, we're going to be calling you again in two more weeks. No, work through two rounds. Round one says, okay, this is the this is the problem in the database. We can change that value, but we actually want to preserve this evidence. So no, we're not going to change this value. We're going to do a dump of the database. We're going to anonymize it, whatever. We're going to make it so I can reproduce it locally here on my system. But round two at least round two, maybe take another round beyond that, we're going to say, why is this happening? So we've identified where is this happening, but round two is why is this happening? And of course, how do we permanently fix it? Those are the keys. So let's look at taking inventory here. We see a little pseudocode. We're going to take the scarce deal details that we usually get from the merchants. We're going to investigate and we're going to form a hypothesis. That's going to be the return type for our investigation here so again as i usually say the information that comes in from the client from our merchant that we're working with i wish it was great and in some cases it is great and this merchant i was talking about tonight they're great like really good detail but we still often have to go beef up this description we have to see what's going on get our feet wet try to replicate the problem we need a document what steps it took to replicate this problem. If we can't replicate this problem, I will give you a quick hint. The problem still happened. It is incredibly unfortunate that for us as developers, we have to get in, we say, oh, I, I can't replicate the problem, thus it did not happen. No, the problem did happen. The merchant is reporting it. It is our job, you and my job to say, okay, how did this happen? What steps could have led to such an outcome? And then we need to go find that. Of course, this is a great time to research what's happening in the code as well. So a quick little diversion here. You are invited to our incredibly awesome Slack channel. It is the second grow biggest and growing Magento-focused Slack community. Some wonderful people in there. I'm in there. Incredibly bright people. I would not put myself as one of those bright people. <laughs> like Some really sharp people are in there answering questions, asking questions, uh, it's kind of what I hoped Magento Stack Exchange would be. That's what this community is. So please, swiftauto.com slash Slack, uh, join us there. Here is an incredibly key point. You, as a developer or detective. So in round one, like I was saying earlier, it's tempting. I kind of already stole my thunder here. It, it's tempting to go into the database to make a fix. We're done. But ultimately, you in doing that would be, could or could be destroying critical evidence detectives don't destroy evidence they preserve it for that later court date that they're going to use to present that evidence to the court to helpfully make that convict the suspect is that i think that's the right terminology there before you change anything in the database make a backup take a snapshot whatever it takes take notes uh, you uh, get a the sql insert to reverse engineer those rows that you just deleted whatever it takes preserve the evidence by destroying evidence you are also likely destroying your path to a solution, a permanent solution, not just a one-time solution. So 
Number one is attempt or is take an inventory. Number two is attempt to fix. Now we take our hypothesis here and we're going to fix it. And then we're going to return whether or not we get a solution. If we do get a solution, cheers. And if we don't, um, well, we got to keep, we have a little bit more work to do. So it, and ultimately in this step, anything goes. We are doing our best to get a quick and dirty solution. I'm not talking about a, a, a long-term perfect solution or whatever, quick and dirty solution. And I even cack the course sometimes like, okay, what's going on here? The core is maybe a problem here. And occasionally I do find a bug in Magento core. Even core hacks are okay. But when you do, a little suggestion, put a comment in there with your name. You, you'll like it if you go back through and try to figure out why is this system, why is the system behaving weirdly? And it turns out, yeah, you actually hacked the core. So those comments are incredibly important. But it's very important, though, to set the time limit. So as you're working, you have this information, you know how this is happening, you know all the inputs for what's happening. That came from step one, take an inventory. But now you need, as you're attempting a fix, you also need to set a time limit. Attempt to attempt, or excuse me, take an inventory, maybe an hour or two, depending on your comfort level. This probably is going to be about half the time, uh, 30 minutes to an hour of attempting a fix, trying to take your information and yield a, uh, a solution to this problem out of this information. You must be willing to stop. It's, that's absolutely critical to stop, to back up. And as you see back here, to do it again, do it again. That's absolutely critical. So we go through this, 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 uh, this cycle. So first we're gonna take an inventory, then we're gonna attempt to fix while there is no solution. Once we have a solution, great, go ahead. You know, we're done. And if, and if your solution looks really bad, if it's poorly implemented, if it's not using, if it's a plugin against non-API methods, like go figure out a better solution for this. That's, that's very important to do is in this do it again step. But ultimately the goal here is just to back up, look at what's going on. Like literally to take a break, to stretch your legs, even if that site is down. I know this sounds bad to say, but even if that site's down, you are probably going to jump five steps ahead in your troubleshooting if you take a 60 second break, even a two minute break, walk around the building, something, just to get your mind off of this computer screen, these, these LED monitors, whatever, to get up, walk around, come back and sit down again, you'll be much happier. It's also very important to document what you've tried. Take notes, okay, I've tried this, I've tried that, I've tried this and that. After three or four rounds, you're gonna totally forget what you've tried. These diving deep into debugging, totally forget what, you're, what you've done. And then you start running the risk of starting to re-debug what you already debugged, and that's a waste of time. Um, also, it's very important to communicate back to your project manager, i.e. the merchant in one way or another. The merchant, if their site's down, uh, they are gonna be uh, panicking. They're gonna feel very much under the gun. We gotta get this site back up. What are you doing to get this back up? And the last thing they want to hear is radio silence for all you, they know you're still, you're, you're in bed sleeping, right? I mean, you're not, you're working your tail off on this, but if they don't hear anything from you, they might, they might think they often think the worst. So communicate back quickly and then ask for help. If you need help, ask for help. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed whatsoever to ask for help. So that was the first section. That was the TAD framework. Take an inventory, attempt to fix and then do it again. Three very simple steps to lead you to success in your debugging. So let's quickly jump through a couple of tools that I think will really help you as well. Number one is Xdebug. I was literally talking to somebody the other day, doing some training, and they were like, "I yeah, I kind of have it working, kind of not. It was on this one project that they did have it working, but another, they didn't. I'm like, Xdebug is the key to solving problems. Like if, if we took away the TAD framework, took every other thing we could ever imagine away from solving problems, we still be able to solve problems if we have Xdebug. Yeah, we could solve it without that. But Xdebug is what literally cuts problem solving time in half by 75%. So I, I don't know the exact number, but it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. We did a survey last year and we're gonna be doing another one here this year. Magento developers worldwide. And well over 50% were not using Xdebug. I'm like, you will revolutionize your experience 
if you by getting Xdebug going. It's not that hard. I have a free course um, mastering Xdebug. Just do a quick Google search for it, pull it up, run through that. It tells you how to install Xdebug, how to use it. You will do yourself so many favors by doing that. So let's look at another thing. How do bugs happen? Well, they happen a lot of different ways. And keeping these ways in mind is very important to helping us solve the problems. Now, the problem I mentioned with the, the uh, adding the class in tonight, uh, don't necessarily, I guess I would fit into the oversights category. It's just not something you would really think of and certainly not the type of uh, visibility that you would expect to come out of this. However, a couple of very important keys to note here is that uh, is this. Uh, number one, we want to use API documented points for customization. If you don't, you run the risk of breakage later. Remember, there was a module on Magento 1 back in the day. They literally seemed to change everything in their module, literally every update. It was massive pain to, 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 to work around. So, well, they didn't have, they didn't have an API. So and that was kind of part of the problem. Um, using a single track for a business logic, this has eliminated a lot of bugs for us. What we do is we have, um, a lot of people think of services, and I think of services as fetching data or collecting data in one way or another. We use a, uh, we create what we call actions. Each action is uh, very similar to the, the ideas you'll find in uh, like the models in, well, kind of the models in uh, Magento inventory, but I think they're better named as actions. So we have a class or we have a module and then we have an actions directory. And then we have all these actions. These actions are small reusable units of functionality. They take an input, you get an output out of them. And it, and it does something, it basically accomplishes, it completes business logic. And they're small, so one can talk to another, which, and they work, they can work with each other. Um, they don't actually, I shouldn't say that, they don't talk to each other too often. Um, but you can just pull out whatever action you need and just work with it. Small methods and classes. My friends, we got to keep these, but get these methods down to smaller methods. I see so much code out there. The methods are like that long. It's impossible to debug to figure out what's going on in that. And also while you're in the code, keep your eyes open for other problems. If you, if you count another bug, document it. Maybe you can solve it right away. Maybe it's a simple fix. And if you do document that you fixed it, extra value for the merchant's money. Um, based off of our time, let's talk about, uh, well, yeah, let's just, let's just, talk, I would like to talk a little bit more about this, the single track for business logic. So what I find is that the classes that I often see developers writing are big. There's a lot of public methods in there. There's, uh, there's some, there can be private methods, maybe not private methods. So this idea that I was talking about, the single track for business logic, in our actions directory, every class has one public method and as many private methods as necessary to make it readable and understandable. One public method. Now, of course, the model, just with getters and setters, has a whole bunch of public methods, et cetera. But keep your, ideally keep, have it be one public method per class. There's some exceptions. Uh, models and view models are the two uh, big exceptions there. Uh, but you're able, it solves so many problems by having each unit of functionality does, does that one thing, does it great, and then everywhere in the entire system points to that one class. There's much fewer places for a bug to creep up because this one developer wrote this exact same business logic over in this part of, the, uh, of it, and uh, thus, thus you're trying to troubleshoot where does this all happen. It happens in one place. Write integration tests against it or whatever if types of tests if you want to. Write it against that one place. You're set and done. Um, absolutely, highly recommend that. And then one th other thing on the, I got my notes mixed up. That was my overview slide I was talking about. <laughs> so uh, small methods and classes. Another very important thing to writing bug-free code. Cyclomatic complexity. Basically, that's how far, uh, try to get this, but whatever. It's however far to the, the right that your code is, is indented. The more that you do that, the harder it is to, uh, to, to read, to understand, to see what's going on. I literally try to have the tab count be no more than two, three is an absolute maximum. So um, keep, that, keep that in mind, 15 to 20 lines of code per method. All right. So um, I would like to quickly wrap this up by 
uh, if you are interested, if you enjoyed what we talked about here tonight, you're going to really enjoy uh, the book, uh, The Art of E-Commerce Debugging. It's a book, and it's also a guided course. It's available on swiftauto.com. Uh, shipped for uh, 10 US dollars anywhere in the world via DHL, fast shipping. Uh, it's has had some great reviews about this uh, and really excited about how it has tremendously helped developers become excellent debuggers. So with all that said, and without further ado, I would be more than happy to answer your questions here for the next couple of minutes about debugging. So if you have questions, feel free to, um, all right, I'll see the first one pop in here. Ah, <clears throat> yes, so if the site is broken down, that's a good term. Many developers are stuck on, stuck on how to start to check and what is a problem. Absolutely. So a lot of it depends on what type of error we are getting. One of the first things I'm always going after is logs. Um, it, well, if we can, if there's somehow the site's in developer mode, which it should never be, but if it's in developer mode, then you have like your error written out there to the page. If it's not in developer mode, then uh, you're going after the logs. Uh, var log system, var log exception. You're looking at the, um, uh, the, uh, the Nginx or Apache access logs, the error logs. Uh, those are those are literally the first place to start. You are looking for what code is breaking and uh, what's going on. There's a couple of there could be a situation where uh, you can't get any logs, and I'm trying to remember. Um, oh, <clears throat> great example! The other day, uh, I made a stupid mistake. I'm very much human. I make mistakes. I was like, we're working on two three on um, Magento two three website, and um, well, I'm backing up. Let me let me back up real quick. The um, problem was that the one of the pages on the website was totally blank. There was no error logs. There was no output. Nothing on the page. So the next step was to take a snapshot of the, of the website. Work on this locally. Again, xdebug is your absolute key friend uh, to getting this solved. And I go through a whole bunch of these examples in the book. I went jumped in xdebug, step line by line through it. Turns out made a stupid mistake. I was working on two three. I tried to use the controller to implement, I tried setting the controller controller to implement HTTP get action interface, which that's not really built out in 2.3. That was a stupid mistake. Um, all right, uh, is there a way to get all the files uh, used in GraphQL? I am, oh, any debug tool for um, Magento Frontend, uh, Chrome developer tools all the way. Uh, there is a uh, knockout JS uh, tool which can give you some like the context and that's really really helpful for debugging some of the front end stuff like the checkout uh, UI components. Uh, is there a way to get all the files used in GraphQL? It's been a while since I've looked in that so I'm not going to give you an answer. You feel free to email me joseph at swiftauto.com or even better yet jump into our slack uh, swiftauto.com slash slack drop the question in there. I don't have a good answer for you at this time but I'm sure somebody in slack will. Um, what it happens, what are you doing debug into live site if something wrong happens? So one thing to note is that I never have ever installed or enabled xdebug on a live site. Uh, it'll slow the site down. So in the end can, can possibly create some problems. I, I could see it being possible for a worst case scenario, but I always take a snapshot of the site, replicate that locally, and then I do my uh, debugging from there. How to resolve the issue if any XML file has any error. In my experience, uh, most XML files are uh, pretty, or th those errors are usually are pretty detailed, um, which is a good option or a good thing to, to work through. Now, that said, um, one thing I always like to do is you can take the XML file. So like um, di.xml, and that's a bad example, webapi.xml. Um, you change that .xml to .xsd, so get the, uh, the schema declaration. Go search in your in PHP Storm for just hit shift twice, um, um, webapi.xsd, find that file. And then you can go, that literally shows you all the options that are available. It's kind of hard to read. So in PHP Storm, you can go to, I think it's tools. Um, there's like XML actions. And then you can basically create an XML file from that XSD file. So it's like taking this, the schema and then creating a pseudo XML file from that in which you can see all the options. So that gives you, and I, that, that will also help you point out, point out what error you might have made, like you included an invalid attribute or something along those lines. And it shows you what attributes are all available. Excellent. I think we're out of time.
Um, great conversation. Again, uh, if you are, if you want to carry the conversation on, I'm going to bed now because it's uh, midnight my time. But if you are uh, so inclined, so interested, feel free to jump into our Slack channel, swiftauto.com slash Slack. And we'd, I'd love to be able to carry on this conversation with you here tomorrow. Uh, but I wish you the very best. Uh, so excited about this uh, whole um, Magento Live India and looking forward to seeing all the great stuff that's going to come out of it tomorrow for me.